Hello, 8th grade social studies. This is Mrs. Politsky, and I have your notes for Chapter 9, Section 3, the first political parties. And as we go along, fill in what you need. Uh, if you need to uh, stop the video or advance it, feel free to do so. So, um, first political parties. You know, President Washington, when he left office, he warned against political parties uh, because he thought that they would divide our nation. And by 1796, after he had left office, uh, Americans were beginning to split into two different groups. Primarily, you had our Federalist and what's going to eventually be known as the Democratic Republicans or AKA the Republicans. So, our leader of the Federalists was Alexander Hamilton. The leader of the Republicans was Thomas Jefferson. Uh, on the Federalist side, they, the Federalists supported government by representatives, whereas the Republicans feared a strong government uh, that was controlled only by a few number of people. Federalists believed that the government had broad powers that were implied by the Constitution. And any time that we see the word implied, it's not necessarily written into Constitution, but it is assumed. Uh, the Republicans or Democratic Republicans believe that only government only had the powers that were explicitly stated in the Constitution. And thus they shouldn't have any more powers than that. So, in 1796, uh, the two parties held meetings, and they were called caucuses, where members of Congress and other leaders chose the party's candidates for office. The Federalists chose John Adams, who had been the vice president under uh, George Washington, and he had been kind of well known. I mean, he had been involved in the Continental Congress. Uh, he had been involved in uh, raising support for the Revolutionary War, and he also was involved in the Constitutional Conventions. So he was a well-known fella. The Republicans or Democratic Republicans chose Thomas Jefferson, who during the debates for the Constitution, uh, he was actually kind of labeled as an anti-federalist. So this was the first time that candidates identified themselves as members of political parties. And it, it's only gotten worse. So John Adams received 71 electoral votes to win the election. Uh, Jefferson finished second with 68 electoral votes. So, I mean, it, it wasn't necessarily uh, a landslide victory for John Adams by any means. But under the Constitution at that time, the person with the second highest number of electoral votes automatically became vice president. So you have two people of two different parties who are now going to have to work together. That sounds like a nightmare. Okay. If you take a look at the map below, you might note that the states of Pennsylvania, Virginia, which by the way, this is supersized Virginia because it also includes what eventually is going to become West Virginia and North Carolina could actually split their electoral votes and they did so. So you have uh, Pennsylvania, 14 going for Jefferson, one going to Adams. You got Virginia, which is Jefferson's home state, uh, 20 going for Jefferson, one going to Adams. Down in North Carolina, which is kind of the south, uh, you have a situation where there is 11 going for Jefferson, one going for Adams. But in the north, where the population was a little bigger, uh, you know, John Adams, you know, he's he's got the numbers here. So, um Jefferson became the new vice president. Uh, the new government in 1797 was a Federalist uh, government with a president who was a Federalist and a Republican who was a vice president. Okay, there's been a few times when we've had people today who are campaigning for the presidency, they'll pick a vice president who is not of their political party. It's not unheard of, but it's not necessarily always an easy fit. Uh, there might be a reason for why people would do this. Abraham Lincoln, matter of fact, chose a Democrat um, to be his vice president in his second term. And part of that was to uh, bring some unity back to the country after the, the Civil War. Unfortunately for Lincoln, he didn't live much longer after the Civil War. So, you know, sometimes those things don't always 
pan out very well. John Adams as a president, um, you know, he had he had some ups and downs. Uh, he had some difficult situations that he had to deal with. Uh, the French in the United States could not agree on some issues, primarily dealing with trade and, and such. Uh, the French thought that Jay's Treaty, uh, which was kind of banning trade with them because of some things that were happening between the British and the French, allowed Americans to help the British. And there was some jealousy there. And I think the French were a little hurt. But you got to understand, uh, in France, 1797, uh, they're just coming out of a bloody, bloody, bloody French Revolution where a lot of people lost their heads. Uh, and I'm not talking figuratively. So the French captured American ships that carried goods to Great Britain. And in 1797, this dispute with France led to uh, a situation known as the XYZ Affair. When free, three excuse me, French agents demanded a bribe from the United States. And Adams was angry at the French actions. It's like, how dare you do this? And rather than like publicly naming these French agents who were asking for the bribes, he just referred to them as XYZ. And he urged Congress to prepare for war because he figured it was going to happen. Uh, just so you know, 1797, this is the era of time of Napoleon. So, yeah, going to war here with the French might not have been a very wise thing to do. In 1798, Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Acts in an effort to protect national security. Aliens were immigrants, okay? And today we still refer to the term alien as an immigrant uh, living in a country who uh, are not necessarily citizens of that country. Sedition basically means any kind of activities that weaken the government. And so the Alien Act would allow the president to put aliens in prison or to send the ones that were considered dangerous or seditious out of the country. So you, the, the big term today would be expatriate. Uh, France and the United States eventually signed a treaty which stopped French attacks on American ships and kind of like, you know, brought us back together again. Okay. Uh, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions in 1798 and 1799 claimed that the Alien and Sedition Acts were unconstitutional and that states could legally overturn federal laws. Uh, the Kentucky resolution said that the state might nullify which basically means legally overturn federal laws if they thought the laws were against the Constitution. Now, if you remember back to when we talked about the Constitution, Constitution is the highest law of the land and states uh, are below that. And thus, this is, this is going to be a question kind of moving ahead, whether or not states can question the federal government. Uh, in a way that isn't necessarily going through the avenues of the Supreme Court. Uh, when we get closer to the Civil War, you're going to still hear about nullification and, and states' rights and things like that. So this is kind of the beginning of a, a much deeper problem. Both resolutions supported the idea of state rights. Uh, this idea says that powers of the federal government should be limited and should be only those clearly given to it through the Constitution. All right. Thank you very much. Hopefully you got everything that you needed written down.